It doesn't sound like we're quite ready to start, but it is 7 o'clock, and I hate to keep everybody who is here on time waiting, so I think we will start. So good evening, and welcome to Cambridge Forum. I'm Pat Zerke. I'm the director of the forum, and I am delighted to see so many people here tonight as we continue our 44th season of free public programs in Harvard Square. This fall, we are talking about renewing American democracy, a timely topic. And I'm very happy to have tonight's speaker in this series, Lawrence Lessig, director of the Edmund Safra Foundation Center for Ethics and professor of law at Harvard University. Before we begin our formal program, I have important things to say, the announcements. Um, there is information about Cambridge Forum on the table at the back near the coffee pot. And there's a list there to which you can add your name, your address, your email address, if you would like information about our future programs. There's also information there about our support organization, the Friends of Cambridge Forum. You are all friends of Cambridge Forum or potential friends and it is thanks to the generosity of our friends that we've been able to present these free public programs for 44 years. So we welcome your donations in support of our public programs, and we are grateful for your support. We, have, we also have copies of Lawrence Lessig's most recent book, Remix, available for sale after the program, courtesy of Harvard Bookstore. It's at the big round table at the back, and I'm sure he'll be happy to sign a copy for you. Our moderator for the forum tonight is Archon Fung, the Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Citizenship and co-director of the Transparency Policy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. He will introduce our topic and speaker, and then he'll open the dialogue after the speaker's initial presentations. As you know, Cambridge Forum's programs are participatory. They are recorded and then edited and produced as half-hour radio broadcasts, distributed on the National Public Radio satellite system. In addition, WGBH is here tonight videotaping the program and it will become a webcast and a downloadable MP3 file on the forum network that WGBH hosts. So you'll be able to jog with Lawrence Lessig if you wish. Um, because our programs are recorded, we ask that when you ask your questions of the speaker later in the program, you come forward and use the microphone here in the center aisle so that your question in your voice is recorded as well as the speaker's answer. And of course, by coming forward and using that microphone, you are giving us permission to record you, edit you, broadcast you, distribute you on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So somebody may even be able to jog with you someday. So we record everything. There is, however, one thing we do not want to record, and you know what that is. That is the ringing of your cell phone or other electronic device. So now is the time to turn them off, and while you're doing that, here's our moderator to introduce the program and the speaker. Thank you very much, Pat. Welcome to the Cambridge Forum discussing Change Congress with Lawrence Lessig, Professor of Law and Director of the Safra Foundation Center for Ethics at Harvard University. Last winter, the US Supreme Court gave corporations the right to make unlimited contributions to political campaigns in their Citizens United decision. In this election season, it will be very difficult even to identify the sources of funding for many political campaigns. In the Senate, a minority of senators can delay or kill legislation that is supported by the majority, and a single senator can stall consideration of political and judicial appointments for any or no reason at all. Is this democracy in action? Lawrence Lessig argues that the American system of representative democracy is broken, and he offers a proposal to change the way that Congress operates. 
What, does this, what change does he see as necessary to democratically invigorate our system of government and politics? And how does he see those changes coming about? Lawrence Lessig is the director of the Ed, Edmund J. Safra Center Founda Foundation Center for Ethics and a professor at Harvard Law School. Prior to returning to Harvard, he was a professor at the Stanford Law School where he founded the, centers, uh, the school's Center for Internet and Society. The author of five books, most recently Remix, uh, Professor Lessig has also written for Wired, The New Republic, and many other popular and scholarly journals. He has served on numerous boards, including the Free Software Foundation, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and is currently on the board of Creative Commons, MapLite, and Change Congress, among others. Professor Lessig has had three careers so far. The first addressed constitutional transformations in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Empire. Then he turned his attention to law and technology. He now returns to problems of democracy, but this time at home in America. His current work addresses institutional corruption, relations, relationships which are legal, but which weaken public trust in institutions. Out of this research comes his urgent argument about the need to change Congress and the way that politics is conducted in America. Welcome to the Cambridge Forum, Lawrence Lessig. Thank you very much, uh, Arkan, and thank you for having me at this extraordinary forum. Um, how many people have seen me present um, a lecture before? Okay, so you know, I have a particular style, um, which I learned because I learned how to speak in front of geeks who would sit in the audience with their laptops open, doing everything except listening to me speak. So I developed a technique that uses Keynote um, to capture people's attention, and a lot of people like the technique. Indeed, I'm constantly asked to speak, and I got the impression I've gotten the impression that people only want to hear me speak to see the technique. So I'm extremely honored to be asked to speak in a context where they won't permit me to use slides. It makes me feel like they actually just want to hear what I have to say as opposed to see the techniques. Um, but uh, this, today, when I was putting this together, I realized I don't actually know how to speak anymore without slides. Um, so I've prepared a little uh, slideshow up here that I'm going to see um, as I present my show here. I might be distracted at the very cool techniques as I'm going through this, so I apologize up front, but, um, but I hope that uh, this message gets carried through. So, appropriate to being in an institution like this, I want to start with a text, a text from a kind of Bible of American literature, um, a text written before 1846, about 13 miles from here at Walden Pond by Henry David Thoreau. This is what Thoreau said. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Now, because you're the sort of people who come out to an event like this, I'm absolutely convinced that every one of you is the sort of person who is out there striking at the branches of evil. Your issues are different. Some of you might care, for example, about health care. You might have been in the health care debate fighting to get health care change, and you look at what's happened over the past year and a half, where we, of course, got health care change, but because of the enormous influence of drug companies the government can't even negotiate low-cost drugs from the drug companies to support this health care reform. And because of the enormous power of insurance companies, we now have a mandate that people buy insurance from those companies, but no competitive public option that would keep the prices down. Or you might be convinced that global warming is the next greatest issue that America should face. And you look back over the last two years, two years after we elected a Democratic majority in the House, a supermajority in the Senate, a Democratic president convinced that global warming was real and we had to do something about it. And, yes, just, and yet just last July, the Senate leader announced that even the relatively tame proposal that came from this state would be dropped from consideration for this election cycle. 
Or you might be convinced that network neutrality is a critical issue. After all, this president was elected with the promise that he would deliver network neutrality. His chairman of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, immediately upon being appointed, announced this as his most important priority. He launched a program to do something about it, and that program now has completely stalled as the influence of the largest, most powerful contributors to politics in America stops any significant change in that policy. Or you might think, after this extraordinary collapse in the economy just last, the last two years, that we need to do something to restore sanity to financial regulations. After all, for the last two decades, we have seen this extremely senseless process of deregulating every single aspect of our financial regulatory system to an extent that I don't think most people even recognize. I asked a colleague, Frank Partnoy, who studies this change, to, to estimate the difference between the financial system that existed circa 1980 and the financial system that existed circa 2008. And he said the big difference between those two systems is that in, is that in 1980, the dominant mode by which financial, financial instruments were regulated required that they be transparent and public and have non-fraud requirements attached to them. And he estimated 98% of all financial instruments in the United States in 1980 were subject to those three requirements. But in 2008, 90% of financial instruments in our economy were exempt from those three requirements. Because of this process of deregulation that created this extraordinary shadow banking system which encouraged the kind of speculation that led to this bubble which when it collapsed brought down most of the American economy, yet the one part of America that was saved in this collapse was those square miles on that island in Manhattan, which received an extraordinary bailout from the government to assure that those banks would not go down, and then free interest money from the Fed so that they could make back the profits they needed to pay back that bailout. And then for two years in a row, those entities that we bailed out have paid the largest bonus to their employees ever in the history of the financial system. System too big to fail, and after the financial reform regulations that we've just seen implemented, they are still and will still be too big to fail. Or you might be a Republican. I hear the Republicans here in Cambridge. I haven't met many, but I hear they are. You might care about issues like simpler taxes. And you might look at the fact that we have had many, many years of Republican presidents over the last 40 years, Republican presidents who were elected under the promise of simpler taxes. But if you look a little deeper at the reasons why those Republican presidents have failed in delivering simpler taxes, there's a pretty obvious economy going on here. The government gives out what they call targeted tax benefits, these are special tax benefits that are received by just small groups of companies or entities. They get, they get specified in general terms, but the general terms turn out to point out one particular company, so it might be a tax benefit for all companies beginning with the letter G that were incorporated on January 1st, 1984 in the town of Newton. And it turns out there's only one of those companies that was so incorporated. So these targeted tax benefits give special benefits to these companies. And indeed, there was a study published last year that estimated the value of these targeted tax benefits as a function of the money spent lobbying for them. And this study calculated that for every $1 spent in trying to get these tax benefits, the average return was between six and $20 in lower taxes. Pretty good return if you can get it in business. So these targeted tax benefits are handed out by our government, and you might think, why doesn't our government ever pull them back in? And the answer is that under the current system of funding our government, every year these benefits have to come up for renewal. And every year when they come up for renewal, 
the congressmen sitting on those committees pick up their telephones and they call the people who benefited from these targeted tax benefits. And they say to them, geez, you know, we're gonna need some support to make sure your targeted tax benefit survives in this latest round of reform. And of course, support translates pretty obviously in that context into an extraordinary amount of campaign contributions. It is a money machine that this tax committee oversees. Not the tax income that our government gets, but the campaign finances which they get by having such enormous power over our system. These are the branches of evil, and all of you are hacking at these branches of evil, but the question I want you to think about tonight is, what is the root? What is the root? that leads each of these areas, and we could go on for hours and talk about every single area of government policy to produce the most insane policies our country has seen. What is the root here? Now, in my view, the root is a certain kind of economy of influence that has taken over Washington, D.C. It's described brilliantly in a book by Bob Kaiser, called So Damn Much Money. And that book recounts the change that has happened in Washington over the, just the last 30 years. And the change has produced this extraordinarily efficient mechanism in Washington for effectively selling policy. At the center of this mechanism are lobbyists, important parts of any government system, even in my ideal system we would have lobbyists. But these lobbyists play a very special role in the system as it exists right now. First, you have businesses who realize they need lobbyists because lobbyists are increasingly delivering to them the kinds of returns that it's just too hard to earn in the marketplace anymore. So I told you about the targeted tax benefits. Here's another study from Kansas which estimated the return on investment for lobbyist dollars spent in the American Jobs Protection Act a couple years ago, they calculated the return on investment for special provisions added to that act was 22,000%. So if you're a business person and your innovation chief comes to you and says, I've got a great new idea and I think we can earn 30% return on this great new idea, and your lobbyist comes to you and says, I've got an even better idea, we can get 22,000% if you give me more of your money, guess where your CEO is going to invest his money? So the lobbyists realize that they have something valuable that they can sell to their clients. But the only way they can sell this policy is if they can convince the members of Congress to do what the lobbyists want, which means they have to make the members of Congress dependent upon the lobbyists. And of course, in the current system of campaign finance, as the cost of campaign finance has gone through the roof, as members of Congress spend between 30 and 60% of their time raising money, it's fairly obvious how the lobbyists can begin to become the essential component to a candidate's life, which is by channeling and contributing campaign funds. So it's not so much the direct contributions, those are important, but not critical. It's the ability for the lobbyists to play the money game, to essentially promise to secure funding coming from whatever interest that lobbyist is representing, not explicitly as a quid pro quo, nothing violating any law, but in that delicate dance that is the dance of Washington. As one Boston politician said, Washington is the sort of city where you never write if you can call, you can never call if you can speak, you never speak if you can nod, you never nod if you can wink. It's a city where they are so fully comfortable with the dance of this interaction that produces this kind of dependency that they do it quietly and legally, but this in plain sight system produces this extraordinary dependency of members of Congress on their funders. And not just during the term that a member of Congress has in Congress. 
in addition to their time in Congress where they depend upon the lobbyists to channel money into their campaigns, they depend on their lobbyists to give them jobs after they've left Congress. As Congressman Jim Cooper describes it, Congress has become a farm league for K Street. Increasingly, members think that their career is never to return back home to the place where they came from, but to stay in Washington and serve as lobbyists. So estimates up to 50% of senators in 2004 had left to become lobbyists, 42% of members of the House. The business model of being in government explicitly incorporates now for members and for staffers the idea that they will leave government and go into the lobbyist business, which means the business model depends upon the lobbyist system continuing to be as effective as it is in selling policy. So we have this Congress dependent upon the funders. Now, as was mentioned in the introduction, I teach constitutional law. And in constitutional law, we focus a great deal, some think too much, on the framers of our Constitution. Indeed, I clerked for Justice Scalia, who is obsessed in all sorts of weird ways with the framers. So framers of our Constitution, I think, are a legitimate focus for this debate. Here's what we know about the framers of the Constitution. They wanted us to have a republic by which they meant a representative democracy, by which they meant a democracy which was, as Federalist 52 puts it, dependent upon the people alone. They wanted to build this dependency. They wanted Congress every moment to feel anxious because they're afraid that the people will throw them out. But the dependency they wanted was on the people alone. They never intended or expected or would have believed that their democracy would have turned into a democracy where the members of Congress are dependent upon the funders primarily. Because the funders, here's the obvious point, right? The funders are not the people. And we have allowed this conflicting and corrupting dependency to develop inside of our Congress, and that corrupting dependency bends this Congress away from the kinds of actions they would take if they were, in fact, dependent as our framers intended upon the people. Now, sometimes people say, well, maybe the funders are the people. Maybe the interests of the funders are the same as the interests of the people. Maybe if we have a system where Congress is worried about what the funders want, that's the same thing as a system where Congress is worried about what the people want. Now, I think it's a little crazy idea, but let's just entertain it for a second. Here's what we know about who the funders are. If you take the calculations made about funders in state elections, because we don't actually have these calculations at the federal elections. Of people who earn $75,000 or less, 80% never give a dime to members running for any political office. And if you take people who make more than $75,000 a year, 80% of them contribute to members of Congress and other political races. So 80% of the, I don't call less than 75,000 necessarily poor, but from some perspectives poor, don't give, and people who make more than 75,000 do give. So there's a pretty stark difference about the kind of people who are giving. So then you might ask, well, does that stark difference actually produce a difference in result? And Martin Guilens, who's a professor at Yale, has tried to calculate this. And he's taken about 2,000 different topics where there's polling data to figure out what different segments of our society want. So the poor and the middle class and the rich. And then he has determined the relationship between what each of these groups want and what policies actually are produced. And he separated out those policies where there's actually a strong difference between what the poor want and what the not poor want. And what Guilens has found is, quote, outcomes are fairly strongly related 
to the preferences of the well-to-do, meaning the government does what the well-to-do, but wholly unrelated to what the poor would want the government to do. So if it's an idea from just 10% of the upper class, there's an enormous probability the government will do it. If there's an idea that 90% of the bottom wants, it's probably not the case that the government will do it. So skewed contributors, skewed results, support the suggestion that actually this current system of dependency is skewing our democracy away from what the people would want. But here's just one example. You tell me what you think of this example. If I asked you, what was the average income of the top 10 hedge fund managers last year? The average income for each of them. We got a billion, do we have more than a billion? So you were gonna say less? 18 million, one billion, what else do we have? 50 million, okay. The average income for the top 10 hedge fund managers last year, average, $2.4 billion. Okay, now, if you looked at the regular tax rates, you would say, okay, they made $2.4 billion, but at least they paid top tax bracket 35% on that $2.4 billion. Did they pay 35% on that 2.4? They pay the capital gains tax rate 15% on their $2.4 billion. This was a loophole which has existed since the 1960s, which President Obama promised when he got into office he was gonna do something about, and when he took that idea to the Democrats running the Finance Committee in the Senate, what they said is, no chance in hell. We are not gonna make these guys our enemy. We're not gonna take away the extraordinary gift we give them by making their tax rates lower than the secretaries working in their offices. That is the system we've produced today, supporting, I think, strongly this suggestion that this conflicting dependency has distorted this democracy. So what is this? in the end do? Well, one thing it does is, I think, screwy policy. Each of these policy areas, I suggest, is influenced by these results. But there are people, political scientists, who are skeptical about this. Indeed, here at Harvard, there are political scientists who say that we don't actually have proof that the numbers in contributions are producing the results in political uh, decisions. There's a very famous paper that says we can't actually see the correlation between contributions and roll call votes in Congress. Which to me is like saying, I flew a drone over the Catholic Church and I didn't see any sex abuse, so therefore there's no sex abuse in the Catholic Church. You know, because again, never write if you can call, never call if you can uh, speak, never speak if you can nod, never nod if you can wink. That's Washington, but okay. It's Harvard, they've gotta be right, so let's assume there's no good proof that there's a connection between money and results. Here's what there is proof of. Here's what we know with absolute certainty. The vast majority of Americans believe there is a tight connection between money and results. And the pollings that I've been part of, that number is up to 88% when we polled in California, 80% when we polled in North Carolina. There is no doubt this is how Americans believe our government works. And that belief, whether true or not, has an enormously devastating effect on our democracy. Its effect is to induce the kind of apathy and disengagement that leads the majority of Americans, and indeed the majority of the sane Americans right in the middle of our political spectrum, to stay home on election day rather than to go out and to vote or to organize to elect their candidate to office. And indeed, when Rock the Vote, perhaps the most important youth vote organization in the country, responsible certainly for the people who turned out and elected Barack Obama, when they asked their members just one month ago, What's the number one reason why the members who said they were not gonna vote in this election are not gonna vote? For the first time in the history of this polling, by a two to not one majority, they said they would not vote because, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. 
That view comes from the perception that money buys results. That view produces a disengaged American public. That disengaged American public leaves the fox guarding the chicken house. That fox has produced, that fox too, but fox <laughs> has produced the democracy we have today. Now, January 21st, 2010, one year and one day after Barack, I'm gonna change the way Washington works, Obama was sworn into office. The Supreme Court took that awful system and made it much, much worse. In the Citizens United decision, the Supreme Court said corporations have a constitutional right to spend independently of a campaign as much money as they want promoting a particular candidate or pushing against a particular candidate. As much money as they want. Now, it's important to keep the money here in perspective. In the 2008 election cycle, the total amount of money raised and spent by all candidates was $1.4 billion. Less than 10% of that money came from people contributing $200 and less. Last year, there was more than $3.5 billion spent lobbying Congress to support things like blocking global warming legislation. Of that $3.5 billion, 1.2% was spent by labor, organized labor. Now, if you take the top 400 companies in 2008, and you imagine them saying to themselves, wow, the Supreme Court has now affirmed our fundamental unalienable right to spend our money to control or direct elections. We're gonna take 1% of our profits and devote it to electioning, 1% of the corporate profits of the Fortune 400 in 2008 would be $6.2 billion. Three and a half times the total amount raised and spent in 2008. Just 1% could completely flood the market in speech with this speech that's directed to a particular end. And that end is not so much them getting out whatever crazy ideas they want to get out. That end is producing members of Congress who know they cannot, if they want to survive in Congress, cross the people who are spending that amount of money. They become dependent, not necessarily directly on receiving the money, they become dependent on avoiding turning those people against them. And so they become exactly the member of Congress that that $6.2 billion would want to buy. So what should we do about this system? My view is we need to find a way to restore the framers' idea here. Find a way to restore a democracy dependent upon the people alone. We need to find a way to create a system where funds that elect members to Congress come from small dollar contributions only. Now there's one bill that actually passed the House Administration Committee about two weeks ago, the Fair Elections Now Act. Fair Elections Now Act says, you opt into a system as a candidate where you promise to take no more than $100 from any citizen, and that's the only money you get to run your campaign. Every $100 gets matched four to one by the government. So $100 is worth $500 to your campaign. And then you get a kind of grub stake amount from the government so that you could compete, given the numbers from 2008, you could compete effectively against anybody. But that system would produce a world where nobody could believe if all the members of Congress lived under that system that money was buying results. It might be that they did whatever stupid thing they did because there are too many Democrats or too many Republicans or too many people who just don't think, but the thing we couldn't believe about that Congress was that it was money that was buying results. And so that Congress, a Congress elected under that kind of system would make trust possible again. 
It would make it possible for us to believe that that was a government guided by something other than the money. It would make it possible for us to believe, again, that this was a government, as Lincoln told us, of, by, and for the people, or to adapt that, the people alone. Now, how do we get there? Let me just end with this one final story. So, somebody made fun of me and came in because I'm wearing these funny shoes. These are Keds. I'm wearing Keds. I now always wear Keds because Keds were made by this company, Stridewright. Stridewright um, was founded by this man, Arnold Hyatt. Arnold Hyatt is a Democrat. He was, uh, in 1996, the largest contributor to the Democratic Party. I'm sorry, second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. And in 1997, President Clinton invited the 30 top contributors to the Democratic Party to a dinner at the Mayflower Hotel to tell him, President Clinton, what he should do with the final term of his administration. So at the dinner, all 30 of these people stood up one by one, and they told the president what they thought the president should do. And Arnie was the last to speak. And when it came to his term, Arnie stood up and he said, Mr. President, I know you're a big admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I want you to put yourself in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's mind in 1939, when Roosevelt recognized that he had to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. He said, because Mr. President, that's what you have to do. You have to convince a reluctant nation to, to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against Nazis, a war against fat cats, people like us. People who believe that merely because we have all the money in the world, we have a right to control what our government does. People who believe that you must pick up the phone when they call because they write the checks that elect you and your party to office. As you can imagine, after Arnie said this in this room of fat cats, um, there was silence. He sat down. In his own diary, he recounts this as feeling like a skunk at a garden party. <laughs> um, the only recorded account that we have of this says that after Arnie sat down, the president proceeded to cut him to pieces. We didn't come to power to give up power. We're going to fight this in the same way we fought any political battle. Now, I think 14 years after Arnie started this campaign, we need to recognize that it was Arnie who was right and President Clinton who was wrong. We need to recognize that we need to find a way to convince this reluctant nation to wage this war to save democracy. Now, two years ago, some of us thought we had a candidate for that war, a man who went around the country saying things like, if we do not change our politics, if we do not fundamentally change the way Washington works, then the problems we've been talking about for the last generation will be the same ones that haunt us for generations to come. We had a candidate who said, for too long, through both Democratic and Republican administrations, Washington has allowed lobbyists to campaign uh, and campaign contributions to rig the system no matter what it costs ordinary Americans. A candidate who said, if we are not willing to take up that fight, the fight to change the way Washington works, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. Now that candidate has not taken up that fight, but we must. We, the people, must find a way to take up that fight. So I'm happy to be here tonight to ask you to stop with the hacking of the branches of evil and strike at the root by helping us to fix Congress first. Thank you very much.
You're listening to Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion of Change, change Congress with Harvard professor, law professor Lawrence Lessig. And the topic of the evening is how can citizens make Congress a more representative body? And now we engage in the dialogue with Professor Lessig. And maybe I'll ask the first question, and it's about how to get out of the chicken and egg problem. And the, the problem, as you said, has only gotten worse since Bill Clinton and Arnie Hyatt had that unfortunate conversation. And now, with a candidate who promised reform, discovers that he, somebody in, in the team discovers that reform is very difficult to pursue and may amount to political suicide for all of the reasons that you laid out. And so there's a real problem of political leadership because already the environment is so self-reinforcing, the money in politics circle is so self-reinforcing that it seems that political leadership is going to be uh, very rare on this problem and yet, without some kind of political leadership, it would have to be relatively spontaneous. And, um, you know, the egg maybe can't hatch by itself is one worry. Yeah. Um, so I go between optimism and extreme pessimism about this. So there's kind of an interesting and hard for, uh, for me, I'm a Democrat, uh, uh, optimistic story to accept. It goes something like this. We're going to have an election in less than a month. Um, Republicans are going to win. With the most grotesque amount of dirty money any election has ever see has seen in the last 120 years. And the whole way that election is going to be defined is this secret money that came into the system without disclosure, much of it from foreign governments or foreign companies. And it's going to create a very strong taste in the Republican Party to disassociate themselves from that image. Now, I'm not saying the people in the Congress who are living day to day trying to figure out how to get the majorities they need to put whatever program they want through Congress. I'm talking about presidential candidates, Republican presidential candidates, who might see an opening here to distinguish themselves from other Republican candidates. So if Newt Gingrich runs, Newt Gingrich during the Tom DeLay years, articulated the most insane policy imaginable that was free markets demanded that we allow government policy to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. That's just what Milton Friedman and, and Adam Smith were all about. You know, totally insane idea, but that was the policy during that period of time. And if you're running against Newt Gingrich as a candidate in the Republican primary, I think a pretty good line to begin to develop is that's not our government, that's not our party, that's not our principle. We believe in something better. So hard for us Democrats to imagine, but it might actually be that on the right, the most important move happens to open up the possibility of citizen-funded elections um, uh, and, uh, and, and push for something that could be credible. Um, when I'm less optimistic, and it's weird to imagine hoping Republicans is called optimism, but um, when I'm less optimistic, you know, I think that, as we've talked about, um, the framers gave us one way out. You know, they, they imagined that their government could become captured, and they created a mechanism for escaping that capture. So Article 5 of our Constitution gives the states the power to call for a convention, which can propose amendments to the Constitution, which then have to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. But we've never had a convention. But the one time Congress ever voluntarily radically changed its institutional structure was the 17th Amendment when Congress uh, created an elected Senate as opposed to an appointed Senate. And it did that only because we were within one state of having enough states to call for a convention. And people in Washington got terrified about the idea of this independent constitutional body being formed, and they were so terrified that they raced through as quickly as they could the reform they thought would staunch that reform movement. And so it may be this is, in some sense, the only po political way that we can push that. And then even then, it seems very hard to imagine how that's possible. And I was giving this talk like this at Dartmouth, and a woman said to me, you've totally depressed me, and I apologize for that, but she said, you've totally depressed me, and I don't see how it's possible. It seems to me impossible to change the system. And I don't know why this 
image came into my head, but I said to her, okay, so imagine a doctor came to you and said, your seven-year-old son has terminal brain cancer and there's nothing you can do about it. Would you do nothing? Would you just accept that this creature that you love more than you love anything is just going to be taken? Are you not going to fight to do something about it? And that's the kind of love that I think all of us feel for this country. The same idea, you the experts will tell you there's nothing you can do. Is any of us going to sit there and just do nothing? And I think that's at least the motivation we need. Recognizing how hard this is, there still is a possibility that if we get enough votes, we can change the system. And votes turn out not to be as hard to put together as billions of dollars, right? So, um, so I, I, even if it's impossibly hard, I think there's a fight to be had. You're listening to Larry Lessig discussing Change Congress. Now, let's take some questions from the audience. Please come forward and line up at the microphone if you uh, have a question. And please limit yourself to one question and keep it concise because I think um, people, a lot of people will have uh, some questions to ask about this urgent topic. Yes. Uh, is there any chance of limiting presidents, um, senators, and congressmen, congress, congress people, to one term, one term only, to break the back of this vicious cycle of the lobbyists buying them and getting them beholden to find a, a second, third, fourth, fifth term. So I used to be a strong supporter of the idea of term limits. And then after nine years in California, I became a strong opponent to the idea of term limits. And the reason is, California has had term limits. And what that does is produce a government where the only people who know how to do anything are the lobbyists. So you have members who come in and they don't know how to run government. So they turn to the lobbyists and they say, how do we do this? And the lobbyists say, oh, I can help you. Here's how you do this. So it's more power to the lobbyists because you don't have members of Congress who have been there a long time, like Tip O'Neill or my congressman, Tom uh, um, Lantos, who had been there for you know, his whole adult life, who knew how to actually make the system work for the people in the district. So um, I think the better way, instead of limiting terms, is just to change the incentives of the people inside the system to make it so they don't have to worry about raising money from big contributors, to make it so that they can think about raising money from closer to us. You know, still, $100 is not the sort of money that people making $50,000 a year are going to be able to give uh, as easily as us, but I think it makes it closer to that match between the funders and the people. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. It seems to me there's a companion piece to your critique of Congress in, in, in terms of money, which is, the way in which the electoral system is engineered, has been engineered and perpetuated, which um, is a winner-take-all, first-past-the-post system in most of the country, um, where you cannot have third-party uh, uh, opportunities, startups, minority parties, proportional representation. Um, how much weight would you give to this piece of the problem in terms of opposition politics having uh, some uh, oxygen in our country, and what might you do about that, or would you rather leave that aside and focus only on the money uh, as a political strategy, and why do you think it works better not to, to somehow find a way to try to include that? And if I may, what did you learn from Jack Valenti? <laughs> <coughs> oh, I don't have time to tell you everything I learned from Jack Valenti. Jack and I, uh, when he was alive and head of the Motion Picture Association, debated copyright issues five times, and he was an extraordinary soul. Um, I mean, he obviously, I, we disagreed fundamentally, but he was an extremely decent person, brilliant, brilliant man, and, and it was a highlight of my career. Um, but to your question, um, I think there are a lot of problems we have to think about with our democracy. Um, the gerrymandering system, given to us by um, our own Massachusetts Representative Gary. Um, uh, the gerrymandering system, uh, um, you know, bad education of American voters about what the system requires, winner-take-all politics, they're all system things that we need to worry about. But I really think it's not that we need to say that the money in the politics is the only problem to solve. I just think it's the first problem to solve. Because only if you can build a Congress filled with people who are committed to this kind of you know, clean politics 
committed to this kind of reform, can you begin to get them to think about these other reforms too, including you know, Senate reform and all these other issues? So I'm, I'm eager to succeed in this first movement and then to have a conversation about what the next steps should be. Because I know it's easier to imagine those next steps if we get this first one first, but I don't think that those next steps are possible until we get this first one first. Uh, there was a story in the New York Times uh, website uh, Monday morning, early Monday morning by Sewell Chan, about the three Tea Party members, one of whom was Ken Buck, who's running for the Senate in Colorado. And uh, it said that uh, Ken Buck thinks that uh, uh, that, that the, the role of the Fed, the Federal Reserve, in the subsidization and encouragement and general bucking up of the corporations needs to be investigated. Uh, now, I know that you're associated with the coffee party, with which I'm also loosely associated, and we tend to think of ourselves as being opposed to the Tea Party, but is this possibly an area of common ground uh, that's one question. And, and then another question uh, submitted, this is suggested by a, a, a friend of mine is, do you think that this new Consumer P Protection Agency associate, uh, to be headed by uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, is, is likely to work or help? Yeah. So um, with respect to the Tea Party, yeah, I, I am um, a happy uh, um, supporter of what the Coffee Party is doing so long as the coffee party does not make the Tea Party the enemy. You know, I, um, I know there's a lot of things the Tea Party does that angers people, um, but the problem in America is not that we have people who disagree with us. <laughs> the Tea Party is not the problem in America. The problem in America is a government that's not responsive to the people, either on the right or the left. And the polling that we've done actually proves exactly your intuition that in fact the grassroots Tea Party people, not the people at the top who are just using the Tea Party as a way to buck up the Republican Party in Congress, but the grassroots Tea Party people are people who genuinely believe that the problem with our government is corporate control or money control of politics. So I too think that the story of the Fed in this last crisis is all the reason in the world to rethink the limitations on what the Fed does um, and, and, of course, investigating that is, is an important step in that. But the process we should be focused on is producing a democracy responsive to the people, whether it's the left who wins or the right who wins. And so most of my push in this debate is, is to get people to recognize that if we have a hope, to go back to your question, it's by tapping into this energy, even of people we disagree with. We can say to them, we don't have common ends but we have a common enemy, and the common enemy is a democracy not responsive to the people. And as to Elizabeth Warren, of course, she's a local hero. I think what she's done with the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, um, getting it passed was unbelievable, literally unbelievable. People thought it was a joke that she would succeed, but she succeeded. Um, and I know she's going to do an extraordinarily important job in setting it up in a way that makes it possible to succeed. I, uh, I was hoping you could comment on um, sort of, because you've seen uh, or you've studied in the past um, democracies in other nations, if there are any other sort of uh, precedents, you know, in, in, in whatever strain or angle that you've seen anywhere else. And, uh, and uh, if I can just make a, a short comment, I, uh, um, in my short experience, when it comes to forums like this, when it comes to trying to attend uh, organizing meetings and, and, organize, and rallies of different sorts, um, uh, it's, it, it's amazing to me the, uh, the ability of rational, reasonable, well-spoken, truthful arguments to, uh, to sort of be drowned out by uh, a, almost a, a singular source, which is television. Um, I've only... I've only been interested in politics for two years, but um, I was hoping you could, if you could comment on um, also uh, um, how to sort of engage communities. Um, I've lived overseas uh, for part of my life, and uh, um, it, it seems we're a very sort of atomized nation, and uh, it, it, you know, how do we sort of get this thing going? I think that um, it astonishes uh, other democracies, I mean leaders in other democracies, exactly uh, to see and understand exactly how this democracy is developed. I mean, you know, I wouldn't say that 
countries around, there are countries around the world without problems to worry about, and there are certainly countries that have a culture of corruption that's different from the culture of corruption in our country. You know, I think our Congress today is filled with the most clean, um, ethical Congress people from the standpoint of people who would never take a bribe and never engage in that kind of quid pro quo corruption. You know, the 19th century in America was filled, it was a cesspool of this kind of corruption in government. That's not our problem today. And there are other countries in the world where that is the problem. But countries, you know, comparable democracies, I was in Sweden, I spoke at the Swedish parliament and went to dinner with a whole bunch of members of parliament. And this one member of parliament who was a geek, he was a, he was a, he was a uh, GNU Linux, uh, coder, and that's what he did, and then he decided to go into politics, and he ran, and he became a representative. He said to me, I have literally never once in my whole political career asked anybody for money, period, never. And so my job every day is to wake up and to figure out what good policy is, like what makes sense for Sweden. That's what I care about. And you sit there, and you, you, know, you explain to them, well, our members of Congress wake up every day, and they think, how am I going to get through the three or four hours of calls I need to make to raise the money I need to run for Congress. So if you actually watch what happens on Capitol Hill, you know, they have this insane system of voting where they like vote on all these procedural issues that don't mean anything, but you have members who race from the floor to just off Capitol Hill into these little cubicles where they put on headsets and they dial for dollars during the time when there's no voting and then the bell rings and they get up and they race back up to the hill and they vote on some whatever stupid procedural issue and they come back down and do the same thing. That's their life. And so those people, you know, even if you don't think that they're being bent by the fact that they're thinking just about what funders want as opposed to what the people want, those people are not working, right? If you're, emplo you're a business employee and your employees are spending half their time outside of your office doing whatever the heck they want, you'd say, you're fired, right? You, we hired you to work full time and spending 30 to 60% of your time raising money is not full time, right? Especially, it's not as if we don't have problems in America, right? It's not as if we don't have issues that people ought to be focusing on if you're running a government and yet they're not, they're focusing on raising money. And that's radically different from the way other countries deal with it. Um, now as to the you know, political drowning out, yeah, I mean, I too you know, get depressed at the way issues get misunderstood and torn apart and um, but again I think the Tea Party is um, has a practice that we need to learn from and the practice is to organize as many events like this as is possible and not to expect in the next year we're going to win in Congress and the next year in Congress but after three or four years of a thousand events like these happening every year across the country in groups of 10 or 50 or 100 can begin to develop a taste, a sense of what the right answer here is and distinguish between the politicians and citizens. Right, so my, my group, um, which is Change Congress, our site is fixcongressfirst.org. You know, our board is filled with people who say, number one, we are not politicians. We are not running for anything. We promise. I've already promised my first male-born child, the one um, who came in my head, uh, if I ever run for, any, uh, for Congress. Like, that's not what I'm doing. We're not running for anything. But we're citizens who believe we have to stand up and fix the system, take control, fix it, and give it back to the politicians. And if that's the way the movement gets defined, and there are enough people who participate in that, I do think it's possible to have a discussion that people understand. Uh, not on Fox News or MSNBC, but in face-to-face, peer-to-peer conversations more than 140 characters, um, but I, I think we could convince them. Hi, Larry. I'm wondering if uh, you really see any uh, room for optimism with regarding legislation such as the Fair Elections Now Act, given that, well, first of all, it didn't really go very far this term around, um, but the fact that it is an opt-in system. Is there any reason to believe that any substantial number of uh, politicians would opt into something like this? And even if it weren't an opt-in thing, if it was mandatory that they all you know, use this system, would that even help, really? Because wouldn't you know, their corporate buddies just then go and pay for their own, rather than putting money into their campaign fund, go and put up their own ads that support or advocate or whatever? Is there really any reason to have optimism for anything short of constitutional change? So um, you're right. It only passed the House Committee on Administration. But I'm... 60% confident that Nancy Pelosi will bring it up for a vote uh, after the election. 
and the House will pass it. We have the votes, we can pass it. Um, but of course, one reason we can pass it is uh, it's not going to pass in the Senate. Um, so people say, well, what's the good of that? Well, the good of that is all of a sudden people can begin to think about what would the world look like if that's in fact the system. They can begin to have that as a part of the political debate. What would politics, uh, how would politics change? Um, now you raise a, uh, you know, a very important empirical question and a very important practical question. The empirical question is how many people would participate? Well, in states which have done something similar, Connecticut's the most recent, um, Connecticut passed a fund, uh, public funding for state election, state candidates. In their first year, 88% of candidates opted into the system. Um, and I think 88% is a, is a good number. Even if it were only you know, 70% or 60%, the point is you begin to create a debate. And people who don't opt into that system bear a very heavy weight, a presumption against them, especially in this political context where people think you're just special interest candidate. So I think that we would get, if the numbers are right, we would get a significant number of people in it. Now, the, the bigger problem is the, is the practical question, which is, given what I st said about 1% of the top 400 companies being able to pull together 1% of the profits being six point, uh, of, uh, of two billion, $4 billion, um, would it matter? And again, I think the answer is, the sequence. We're not going to get a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United any time ever under the current system. There's no way you would get 67 votes in the United States Senate to pass an amendment that would go out to the states and get three-fourths of the states to pass it. It will not happen. But if we had a Congress that was filled with people who ran their elections under a clean election system, there's a chance that enough of them would begin to say, we need to protect and make uh, viable this system. And the only way to make viable this system, given what the Supreme Court has done, and given the possibility that that amount of money will be spent in corporations, is to find a way to change the Constitution to do it. So even if you believe a constitutional change is necessary, you still need to recognize, I think, that this change, this statute, needs to happen first. Um, and I think if it does happen first, we can build, um, we, can, we can at least have the possibility of doing something to deal with the Supreme Court. Um, you had mentioned um, a constitutional convention. Um, do you think there's any, well, what do you think the chances are, percentage-wise, of something like that actually happening? Is it something we would need to get um, meaningful legislation first as a threat, or is it something where we'd have to wait for meaningful legislation to pass first so that we would have enough influence to get something like that um, in play. And then, assuming it was, um, I assume where Citizens United would be a top pick to, to overturn that. Is there anything else you would uh, ideally like to see? Yeah, well, the, the, the trick to the politics of a constitutional convention is that states can call for a convention for any purpose. So you might have you know, Massachusetts that calls for a convention to deal with the money and politics problem, but Texas that calls for a convention for the purpose of dealing with, you know, balanced budget or whatever crazy idea any other state wants to have. And so long as you've got 34 states that call for a convention for any purpose, Congress has got to call a convention. Now, many people are worried because they say, well, the convention would be a runaway convention. It could do whatever, you know, the crazy ideas, the Tea Party takes it over or radical leftists take it over. Yeah, that's not going to happen, but okay, the Tea Party takes it over. And they, um, you know, abolish the Bill of Rights or they ban gay marriage or whatever. Um, I actually think those fears are wildly overblown because no amendment becomes part of the Constitution unless 38 states ratify it, meaning one house in 12 states is enough to block any amendment from being passed. So there are easily 12 red states and 12 blue states in the United States that could block whatever extreme comes from either side. Um, and, I, uh, and I think they would be effective in blocking it. Um, but the other interesting political part about a convention is, if you really believe, as I believe, this has got to be a grassroots strategy, a thousand meetings like this all across the country, organizing to call for a convention in states calling, getting state legislature, is a pretty effective way to make that happen, right? There's a horse race. It is, you know, the state of Connecticut decides it's going to try to get its legislature to pass it. It's pushed. The legislature talks about it. They debate it. They win. 
Right? You know, people are happy that they've won in this one state. It's almost like a presidential primary, but no candidate. You know, we just go state to state trying to win these states, and the more that we win, the more attention that there is to it. And I do believe that even getting close is enough to force Congress to do the right thing. Um, but I also believe that we're capable of dealing with democracy at that level, and if we get close and then go over the board and have a convention, then um, it's not going to do any harm, and forcing people to think about these issues, I think, would do an enormous amount of good. Uh, if I understand <clears throat> your, um, your basic response to the Citizens United dilemma, it's to limit campaign contributions to small individual contributions. Could you just clarify, are you saying that you think there's no argument for associational speech? I mean, unions, for one, important group members come together in order to contribute to political candidates. Are you saying that should be dismantled and there's no hope for the concept of associational speech? Yes, thank you for the question because it's, it's usually, um, this point is usually misunderstood. So I think we need citizen funded elections which you can have without touching Citizens United. I don't think this court, even this court, would overturn as unconstitutional citizen funded elections. Then the question is, well, what should we do because of the enormous amount of corporate money that might be in elections because of Citizens United? My view is not that Citizens United was wrongly decided because it protected the rights of that corporation from speaking. Um, I actually believe that our Constitution should protect the right of corporations, nonprofits, aliens, dolphins to speak. I mean, it doesn't matter. I think we should protect free speech. And the problem in my view is not that you have people who you disagree with who are, who are entitled to speak. The problem is when they have so much power in the political system that the representatives are dependent upon them. So, you know, think of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court hears arguments from all sorts of crazy people. Like, and it, the, the reason why that's not a problem is that the Supreme Court's not dependent on any of them. It's independent of those positions. So, I would not support amendments that have been proposed, like for example by Donna Edwards, um, to give Congress the power to regulate corporate speech. I don't believe in that. All I think Congress needs the power to do is the power to limit but not ban independent expenditures. And limit it not to the position so that corporations can't make their views known, but so that nobody could believe that the money that was being spent was actually controlling or the, dependent, the representatives felt dependent upon that money being spent. And we could make it actually quite precise. You could say, no non-citizen, you know, Congress has the power to regulate the speech of non-citizens by limiting the amount they expend in a campaign, but not banning it. Um, so that would mean the Chinese and the Chamber of Commerce, they're both non-citizens. Um, they, you know, we should hear what they have to say, but they can't be the dominant force in these campaigns. It's a hard, impossibly difficult quantitative judgment, but you would have to give some authority to Congress to make that kind of judgment. Hi there. Um, I had a question, I guess, about strategy. Have you considered going, um, well, as you know, you know, Connecticut, you mentioned past citizen-funded elections. Arizona and Maine have had it for several years. Um, and then there's small, small uh, forms of it on the, on the local level, limited form, forms of it, like Massachusetts actually has it for governor. Um, would you consider you know, aiming state by state in any way, or do you have enough money to have a few st organizers in a single state at a time where you see maybe a movement growing? Well, I think that um, you know, if in fact the Democrats lose control of the House, state strategy becomes you know, the essential place where action's gonna happen in the next two years. Um, and uh, it's not just states, it's also local uh, um, elections. So Portland has a clean elections provision that there's a ballot measure to eliminate uh, this election. And, um, and I'm sorry, Portland, Oregon. Um, and, I, and I'm going out there as part of a campaign at the end of the month to try to fight to make sure that doesn't get removed. So I think that's gonna be an important part of the strategy. But I actually think that you don't, you, People won't notice the difference as much at the state level. Like, you know, we've inverted the way states 
were thought of at the framing. Everybody at the framing thought the states were the most important and the federal government was gonna be completely irrelevant. Now most people kind of don't even know what the state's doing and it's only the federal government they focus on to the extent they focus on anything. And so, you know, if we cleaned up state elections, of course I think it would be better, but I don't think it would create the kind of change in perception that I think is essential to make um, people have faith in democracy. So I don't think ultimately the state strategy is gonna be enough, but I think it's a good pace to begin to you know, talk about this issue so people recognize why it's so important. And yes, I certainly will help whoever we can to get states passed. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as I was listening to you talk about, I mean, the Supreme Court has really screwed us a lot with corporate personhood decisions and Citizen United being the latest. But I'm wondering if there's any way to approach this from the other end, charter reform, to limit the inherent powers of corporations. Now, corporations gained an awful lot of power over the past 200 years. Yeah. Um, I certainly think, although it's not clear from the Citizens United decision, but I certainly think that the states should have the power to condition at least new corporations charter on waiving certain associational freedoms. I, again, for the same reason that was raised before uh, by your question, I'm not in favor of trying to limit associational freedoms even of corporations, but I think the state, the, uh, they would have that power. But there is a strong movement among corporate um, control uh, advocates who are trying to get shareholders to impose limitations on corporations um, John Coates at the law school has just released this fantastic empirical study that demonstrates that shareholders who constrain corporations from um, spending money in political campaigns actually have higher shareholder value, value than corporations that don't. So there's a self-interested reason for them to be doing this. Um, but um, even that, I think, is limited because there are some corporations who should want a world where they don't have to spend any money on politics because they make their money the old-fashioned way. They figure out great new innovations like Ked's shoes. That's what they do. Um, but there are other corporations that depend deeply upon being able to affect government policy the way they want it. So AT&T, you know, is, you'd be crazy as a shareholder of AT&T if you said that AT&T can't spend whatever it can to try to control policy in Washington because their life depends upon bending policy the way they've bent policy. So even if you got corporations to act rationally, I still think there's a huge number of them that would choose to continue to spend whatever they can to affect uh, politics. You referred to studies that indicate that people in general believe that money does buy results in politics. But there's another, another sense among voters, and that is Congress is a problem, but my congressman is fine. How do you cope with that in your desire to change Congress? I actually think you know, we have to embrace and recognize that that view is true. That your congressperson, I'm not just talking about your congressperson here, uh, Capuano is wonderful, but um, I'm not talking about Capuano in particular, I'm talking about Congress people. These are, these are decent, hardworking people who most of them impress people as being exactly the kind of dedicated public servants we want. And I'm sure every one of them went to Congress initially, well, not everyone, you know, the vast majority went to Congress initially believing they were gonna do good in the way they saw they were gonna do good. But they live within a system that they can't uh, help but be bent by the incentives that system creates. So I think, you know, compared to like an alcoholic mother who, you know, wants to do the best she can for her kid every single morning, wakes up thinking, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do the right thing, but by the end of the day just can't help because of this conflicting dependency being bent into doing something different. Um, I think that's our Congress. So I don't think, I, I, in fact, I really, resist people who want to say these are all these evil, corrupt, you know, self-interested people. They're not. They're good, hard-working public servants. They live in a terrible system. And we have to somehow get a little more sophisticated to recognize the dilemma of the good German, right? You know, these are, these are decent people who just, you know, all of us who are not strong enough to stand up and do what we can to fix this system. Um, and the same thing with members of Congress. You know, I, I do get angry at them because this is not like racism or sexism or um, discrimination against uh, on the basis of sexual orientation. These are not views that would take generations to eliminate. You change the incentives and the way members get elected, tomorrow the incentives would be different. 
tomorrow we begin to have a different kind of election system. Um, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, we're still fighting the change to bring, the, to bring about the change that that decision wanted. So I am angry at Congress that they would allow their institution to be so degraded by the current system that they live under. You know, the Gallup poll in July found 11% of Americans have confidence in their Congress, 11%. There were more people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in our Congress today. And they are responsible for that. So is every reason to be angry at them, but not because they're evil, corrupt souls. They're decent souls who just don't have the courage to do the right thing. Maybe I'll jump in with a question that kind of follows on that. I mean, I think you're right. I completely agree that probably the most promising strategy for change comes from a bunch of people mobilizing all across. But it's hard to get people excited about procedural change, about money and policy. It's not the Equal Rights Amendment. It's not civil rights. It's not even low taxes or guns or babies. It's a procedure. It's how we make laws. And um, I wonder if. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, why don't you get um, Well, well my, my question was um, completely along the same lines. Um, I was actually canvassing this summer for the Portland, Oregon ballot initiative that you mentioned previously. Um, and just talking to people on their doorsteps, it's a really, really difficult issue to get people excited about and get them engaged and even get them to, you know, listen to the end of your pitch because they're like, you know, like $5 contract, I've got stuff to do. So, you know, and it, it seems like very, you know, easy in theory to say, you know, we can like make this into a grassroots movement, but like how do we do that in reality and how do we really like make people passionate about this? Yeah. No, I, I agree, this is hard, but here's, here's why I think it's, it's not impossible um, to get people excited about it. First of all, you don't have to convince anybody about it. They already believe it. They already believe the money buys results. And the last two years has given at least people on the left an endless list of things we thought it was easy for us to get with this new majority in Congress and this Democratic president that's been blocked. And you can say your issue is global warming and your issue is health care, but um, what we need to recognize is, again, to pick up the alcoholic's metaphor, you know, the alcoholic could be losing his liver, he could be losing his job, he could lose, be losing his family. All of those are really serious problems, like global warming and, and uh, health care issues and uh, and whatever issue you care about. But what we know about the alcoholic is true about our democracy. Until you solve the alcoholism first, you're not going to solve any of these other problems. And so to this. You don't solve this problem, you're not going to solve the healthcare care problem. You're not going to solve the global warming problem. You're not going to solve the issues of sensible schools. I mean, I don't know if many have seen this film, uh, Waiting for Superman. The number, most significant number in that film, which is about public education, was that the number one contributor <laughs> to... Democratic Party, the top two unions in that, um, and the teachers' unions. Um, and I'm a union supporter, but it makes it impossible for the political system to think about this issue because of the way the system um, uh, approaches it. So whatever your issue is, this has got to be first. And I think if we do it, not in a flashy 30-second commercial on television way, but in the way real stories are told, people to people, and get people to connect these issues, and don't say give up your care about global warming, but give us 20%. Don't say give up whatever issue you care about, but notice you've got to give us 20% of your time to focus on this issue. We can get people to the point where they believe this change has to happen. It's happened in the states, as you said, um, uh, Connecticut, Maine, and, uh, and uh, Arizona. And I do think the support is absolutely there. We spend a lot of money polling on this issue, and we know the support is there on the left and the right if we can just motivate it at the, at the right level to, to, to get it. So that's the strategy. I'd like to ask you to, uh, for some clarification on two points. Um, the first is when you, earlier on you talked about the, the cutoff at 75,000 and that people below that income range typically don't contribute and above that they typically do. What is the percentage of the population uh, as a whole who make less than 70, just for perspective. So what percentage of the population is it who make less than 75,000? So I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know the answer to the question. Um, I do know that the total enough percentage of population that's giving is somewhere around 5%, right? So that's the divert, you know. Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, and, and the second piece is Archon uh, said earlier that um, 
the, the, the current president ran, and other, it's, he's not the first to run on a sort of you know, radical reform, where, and people, some people said, oh, he's going to be a transformative president, and then he gets in and they tell him, I, uh, paraphrasing, uh, you can't do it. Um, could you speak to that? Because to me, I, I actually believe that people want, the reason why they use the rhetoric of reform is because people want reform. And so, in fact, it does work as, as, a, as candidate rhetoric, um, and leaving aside whether they actually believe it or not as candidates, um, that should not be abandoned, I don't think. It's just a matter of, wh how do you see that, 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 dis that disjuncture? Well, I, um, I was a strong supporter of the president. I, I, he was my friend. I, was, I taught with him at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, and I was on the road campaigning for him, and I worked as hard as I could to get him elected. And, and the reason I wanted to get him elected was that not that I didn't like Hillary Clinton, but I thought there was a stark difference between the kind of president Hillary Clinton was gonna be and the kind of president Barack Obama was gonna be. Hillary Clinton was gonna be a president who played the game in the same way the, part of the game has been played for the last 40 years in the Democratic Party. Like try to strike the deal that gets the legislation through that you wanna get through. And my view was, it's not enough. We're not gonna get what we want through that system. We have to have a, somebody who comes in and believes we're gonna change the system and finds a strategy for figuring out how to get this to change that system. And Barack Obama said that. That's what he said he was gonna do. But I think what happened is when he got in, in office, his team was actually the Clinton team. He was appointed by John Podesta, former chief of staff for Bill Clinton. The whole structure was a whole bunch of people who didn't actually believe or thought that this was nice rhetoric. It wasn't actually how to run a government. And they convinced the president, and you know, it's hard to imagine standing up to everybody telling you this is what you have to do, but they convinced this president that, that what he had to do was to put those ideas aside and focus on getting particular things through because of exactly the same point about this is what people really care about, health care. So, and they thought they were, that the president was gonna stand up and woo the Republican Party and we were gonna radically change the way America functions by having health care reform, global warming legislation, new food safety laws, you know, all of these things that we, you know, thought that Barack's persuasive power was going to bring to America. And I remember just thinking, I can't believe they actually believe this is gonna happen. But the more you saw the way the campaign, the administration unfolded, it was clear that's what they thought they were gonna be able to do. I think it was for exactly your reason. I think it was a complete mistake. And I, unfortunately, I, I think in some sense he's given up the opportunity to be that candidate. You know, he, you know he's, he's teased, you know, I feel like we're Charlie Brown, right? We've heard this every single election, change, change, change. And every single election we race up there and try to kick the ball and every single election Lucy pulls it away from us. And, and uh, you know, because we're Charlie Brown, we're gonna try to kick it again, but it's not this president I think is gonna get us to try to kick it. I think you hit a little lucky today because I sort of represent real poverty in America. And I wanted to share what had happened to me from just hearing from you. Well, maybe you could share it in your travel. Um, I just like to admit I'm 73 years old and I guess I was 50, 55 before I even entertained the idea of voting. Uh, life was just that devastating for me. I didn't have the time to be interested in politics. But I want to thank you for being therapeutic today because I have been functioning with the idea that people who engage in politics did not have character. Because in my mind, there's been a lot of hypocrisy. Whereas you have done really well at deter deterring that thought that there's a dependency on funds and that's very different from being hypocritical. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, you've been very therapeutic. I had a question for you. It's a new language. I had not heard it before. A different philosophy of politics. I wanted to know in the review of the literature where did it, who, with whom did it um, originate? The way I'm speaking about this? Uh, the idea that you're floating. Huh. Um. No, I understood the question. I, I just don't know if I know the answer. Um, you know, 
I guess I, as I started talking about this way of thinking about the problem, this sort of competing dependency, um, there really were two sources. Uh, one was an extraordinary law professor uh, from, um, from Fordham Law School, a woman named Zephyr Teachout, who wrote this fantastic paper about corruption at the founding. And the whole point of the paper was to show us, was to show how the Constitution was architected in every single way to avoid corruption. And not corruption, not just corruption in the kind of Rob Lagojevich sense of the word, but corruption in the way that I'm talking about it, the wrong kind of dependency being built into the system, right? The framers thought of independence as someone subject to the right kind of dependence, right? That's what independence is. So we want an independent judiciary. That doesn't mean we want a judiciary that can do whatever the hell it wants. It means we want a judiciary that is dependent upon the law. And we want a Congress dependent upon the people. And we want the executive dependent upon the people and the law, right? That was the way they thought about it. And so her work, you know, made me begin to think about this dependency stuff. Um, and the second source um, uh, was the Supreme Court. Uh, when the Supreme Court decided the um, Citizens United case, and they said the only dependency, the only corruption that the Constitution permits Congress to try to address is quid pro quo corruption, you know, kind of bribery corruption. And in my view, you know, as I thought about that, I thought, well, that's, of course, an important kind of corruption. But this other kind of dependency is also a corruption. It's not a corruption of the souls of members of Congress. It's a corruption of the system. It's like a, a, a compass, right, that's supposed to be pointing true north. And you put a, put a magnet to the side, and you bend it in a direction other than what it's supposed to be because of this other influence. That's the corruption of the system. So there's just as much reason to think of this as corruption as, as quid pro quo corruption. So I'm happy to be inspired by uh, Zephyr Teachout, and I'm a little embarrassed to be so inspired by um, Justice Kennedy's opinion in that case, but those are the two sources, I think. I have one more question. You outlined a little bit of what you thought happened to Barack Obama and his idealism about changing this system. And you also gave a shout out to somebody who actually did successfully change the system, and that was Elizabeth Warren. Um, how did she succeed? How do you see that for a, a positive way to end the evening? It turns out she has magical powers. Um, she showed me. <laughs> you know, uh, um, I don't know. She's, an, she's a force of nature. Um, you know, you hear the story of her sort of traipsing up on Capitol Hill. You know, she and one associate going door to door in Congress. Uh, in a context where the only people who actually meet with Congress people and have any effect are these high-priced lawyer lobbyists, um, you know, there she was making her pitch, and people were bemused at the, the you know, entertaining Harvard law professor up there trying to convince them to create a new government agency. God forbid that we have a government, a new government agency. And eventually, um, in the face of the kind of disasters that happened in the context of credit, people began to come around to recognize this was going to ne be necessary. Now, of course. It's a very important victory, but there are amazing little exceptions built into this bill, right? So um, my f the most disgusting one for me is for um, car dealers, right? Because of course, nobody's ever had a credit problem with a car dealer. And, and the reason for that was a Republican uh, representative from California, Campbell, who himself is a landlord to a whole bunch of used car dealers. He makes about six, uh, between $600,000 and $6 million in rent every year from them. And he himself was a former car dealer. And he receives hundreds of thousands of dollars from the car dealers. He introduced this amendment to exempt car dealers from the Consumer Final and Financial Protection Agency Act. But he's a Republican. So you think, OK, he's in the minority. How did he win? And he won because on the finance committee in the House, the committee that um, uh, um, no, my congressman, um, Barney. Barney Frank is chairman of. Um, the Democrats, the, uh, the first term Democrats, are placed on that committee because it makes it easy for them to raise money to be on that finance committee. And as you looked at the votes of the Democrats, the first term Democrats who needed to raise a lot of money all voted with the Republicans to insert that exemption for used collar dealers into the bill. 
And as you went up the Democrats, the more senior you got, the more they stayed with the sensible policy, which was there's no reason to exempt car dealers from a Consumer Financial Protection Agency Act. So, so the dynamic there was driven, I think, directly by this money. Um, but um, but I, you know, that aside, I, I think we need to recognize she was extraordinary in achieving what she achieved. Well, I'd like everyone to join me in thanking Larry for leading a discussion. That was